Hello, thanks for joining us today. Um, we are getting very near to the end of 1 John um, in our study, our current study. Um, today we are going to be studying 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. And uh, specific prayers. We're going to be talking about specific prayers and how we can know that God hears and answers those. So we're really glad you joined us. Pastor, let's have prayer. That's what I was going to tell you to do. Father, thanking you again, we're uh, going to take a few moments now to be able to share some of your um, history uh, from the Old and the New Testament to be an encouragement to individuals about prayer requests and praying. And so as we look at these two verses, we just ask that you'd be honored and glorified. And Lord, for those that are listening, we pray that the Holy Spirit would help them to have understanding. And it's in Jesus' name that we're praying. Amen. So I'm going to have my wife read from one of the illustrations that we're going to be looking at. And she's going to be reading from the uh, book of 1 Kings and the 17th chapter. All right. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. Yes. All right. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And, her, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto him, Elijah, what have I to do with thee, O thou son of man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to, to slay my son? And he said to her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft, where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, thou hast also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came unto him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down into the chamber, into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. Amen. And what was her testimony? The last verse. And the woman said unto Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. Amen. See, if you ever had any doubts about that before, by this miracle of Elijah raising this woman's son from the dead, um, proved to her that what things he had been teaching her and telling her were actually the word of God. So that's a tremendous testimony. And of course, that went out through the whole family because as you read in the previous verses of that chapter, uh, when God was providing the drink and the bread uh, for her, it also says there that it was for her family, too. So she was able to nourish her family during this time of this drought. And it was Ahab's fault for the drought because of his sin. And, of course, his wife's sin, too. But anyway, moving on from that, these two verses that we have here in First John, uh, the verses 16 and 17, he says, If any man see a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin not unto death. So there's some contrasting things here. And what I'd like to look at, you recall from our previous two messages, we we're talking about assurance in our prayers and the confidence that we have in the prayers that they're going to be answered. But one of the things that we pointed out from the third chapter was that the individuals, as we are praying, we need to make sure that we are keeping the commandments of the Lord. And one of the two of those commandments having to do with loving God and loving our neighbor. Now, there's other commandments that are given too. Uh, and all these violations of these commandments, of course, are sin because sin is the transgression of the law. Well, what do we do, though, when we've confessed all of our sins before the Lord, we've made it a habit of practicing righteousness in our lives, and then what we saw last time in our previous study 
was that we have learned how to pray within the will of God. Mm -hmm. And that becomes very, very important in this context of what we're looking at about praying for people who are on their deathbed or perhaps have already died, whatever the case might be. We need to be in prayer, and that prayer must be always in the perfect will of God. So let's look at a few of the illustrations that we can find here in the Word. And let's start first with noticing in this 16th verse where he said, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life uh, for that uh, sin not unto death. You'll notice there's a conjunction word used here. It's the word and. Mm -hmm. And so the importance here is to realize these are things that are going to be taking place in the future. All of us are going to commit sin. We know that we're sinners. Just as a remembrance from a long time ago, let's go back to the first chapter here in the book of 1 John. And in 1 John, in the first chapter, he said... Um, well, let's start at verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, there is a sin. What is the sin? We lie. We lie. That's a sin. So, and we do not the truth. So, not only are we speaking a falsehood, a lie, but we're also not practicing the truth. Living a lie. We're living the lie. Mm -hmm. So, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another and, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from how much sin? All. All of mm -hmm. our sin. If we say that we have no sin, verse eight, what are we doing? We're deceiving ourselves. Because we still have our sin nature battling with our new nature. And so we're gonna have sin. And then he says, if we say that we have not sinned, then his truth is not in us. So what do we do? We confess our sins. When we do that, verse 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And the next two verses are very important too. He said that, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. There's a commandment that's given to us. But we know that we're going to sin because of the battles that we have. Harmartia means sins that have been done um, in ignorance. They've been done willingly. And so, therefore, um, we, we need to confess our sins. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What is the advocate? It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died and paid the penalty for all of our sins. Then it went on to say in verse 2, He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What is the propitiation? That word very clearly means that Jesus Christ satisfied all the righteous demands that the Father had for the penalty for our sins. Now, if you get into sin and you don't repent or turn away from that sin, Remember that Hebrews chapter 12 will then take effect, which is the one that says that God will chastise those of his children who are involved in sin. So we don't want to forget that. So if you're involved in sin and it's unconfessed, your prayers are not going to be heard, your prayers aren't going to be answered until you repent. And in the meantime, you're going to start receiving the chastising hand of the Lord. But let's move on from that. I'd like us to look at some of the things in the uh, New Testament and the Old Testament. Patty, if you would, read for us from James chapter 5 and verses 15 through 20. James, the fifth chapter, verses 15 through 20. James 5, 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sin, they shall be they um, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elisha was uh, a man subject into like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for a space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, 
and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and um, and one and one convert him, let him know that he which con converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Amen. So there's your illustration from the Old Test, uh, from the New Testament and the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, as the pastor of the church there at Jerusalem is preaching, and he makes mention of this in his uh, letter that he writes. And so we need to be in prayer one for another. There's many people that are sick today, and they need to turn their hearts into the Lord. And we'll summarize that uh, at the very end of our message today. So let's look at Elijah's prayer. My wife has already read for us in 1 Kings chapter 17, 17 to 23, and what did he do? He raised that woman's son from the dead. She was fearful that her sin that she had committed some time before, and we're not given any details about the age of her son, but wouldn't you think that because of the way she stated that, that it was implying the possibility, not saying it was, that she'd had this child out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And so therefore God was taking the child away from her. That was her fear, but that wasn't the case at all. God forgives people for their sins. God was using this as a testimony to emphasize to her that Elijah was telling her the truth. And that's so very, very important. Mm -hmm. He was telling her the truth. So looking at another passage of scripture, which is very, very important, look with me to Acts chapter 20. Here is a New Testament illustration of God answering prayers. Again, this particular situation, the Apostle Paul is very long-winded. We know that from this portion of Scripture because it says that he started preaching. And by the way, this starts in uh, the 7th verse and goes through verse 12. Uh, actually, it goes through um, verse 16. But what happens is... is <laughs> The Apostle Paul's preaching, and notice what it says here in verse 11. He says, When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, mm -hmm. even till the break of day, so he departed. He preached all night long. <laughs> well, there was a young man, according to the verses we were looking at, beginning here in uh, the uh, eighth verse, they were up in a house that had three levels. And there were lights all over the place, and people were hanging around everywhere. Literally, this young man, however old he was, was on the third level up. And Paul's preaching. It wasn't saying Paul put him to sleep, but the man must have been really tired, the young man. And what did he do? He fell three stories. Right out the window. <laughs> oh, boy. Now he's dead. Okay. So you read in the ninth verse, there sat in the window a certain young man named Eucatus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sank down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up. What? Dead. Dead. He died from the fall. Man. So Paul tells him, don't worry about the guy. Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. So Paul, as he was laying there on this young man that had fallen these three stories, he was brought back to life because of Paul's prayer for him. So they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Excuse me, and were not a little comforted. They were so excited that this young man was alive now. And he sat around and he was eating with them. And so uh, that was very, very good. So the guy's name was Eucatus, and of course he died. But don't you so, feel that way whenever you are really praying about something and you see God answer your prayers right before your eyes, whether you've been waiting a long time or a short time, it brings so much comfort and you're so excited. So much joy comes out yeah. of knowing that God's answered those yeah. prayers that we've been praying. It gives you confidence in those prayers. Yes, it does. In future prayers. Amen. So at this point, then, I'd like us to look at one in the Old Testament. This is not a happy circumstance. In the book of Jeremiah, which was written at about the same time that um, uh, 
Babylon was invading the uh, southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin and the remnant from the ten northern tribes. So in Jeremiah chapter 7, notice what we find here with regards to uh, the things that happened that, that God... I really don't know where I want to start in this chapter because the whole context so much sets into the realm of which I'm speaking here. But let me pick just a few of these verses. Jeremiah chapter 7. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there his word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Then said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. So Jeremiah starts preaching, and the first invasion from the Babylonians didn't take place until 605 B.C. So I don't know how long Jeremiah was able to preach, but here he is in the temple at the gate warning individuals that they need to turn to the Lord. And that's the whole message that is being given here. But I want you to notice what happens here. He says in verse 11, Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of what in your eyes? Robbers. Robbers. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go now into my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. So he tells them, if you want to see what's coming, you need to go up to Shiloh and look there and see what I did to Israel for their sins about 105 years, 115 years before this time, 722, 721 BC, or even before that. So now, because ye have done all these works, let me say, they didn't repent, they didn't turn back to God, saith the Lord, I spoke unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard me not, and I called you, but ye answered me not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is speaking there, not only of the nation or the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, but he's also talking about the temple. He says, I'll do unto this house, which is called by my name, in which ye trust, and unto the place which I give you and to your fathers have I done to Shiloh. Now, before we go any further than that, I want you to look back at um, verse 4. I'm going to have my wife read that emphatically because this is what they were crying out in verse 4. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these? You see, they didn't care about God himself. They kept emphasizing the temple, the, building. the place, the building, mm -hmm. not the person of God. Mm -hmm. So therefore, because they wouldn't turn to God, what he says in verses 15 and 16 of this Jeremiah chapter 7, I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole seed of Ephraim. Wow. Therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up nor cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession for them or to me, for I will not hear thee. Jeremiah, don't pray for them. They've had 115 years to turn away from their sin. And what did they do? They didn't. They continued in idolatry. They continued in all the pleasures of the sins that they were involved in. So he says, don't pray for them. Yeah. And judgment came. Came in 605 BC when Nebuchadnezzar invaded uh, Jerusalem. It came a few years later in 596 to 593 BC when Nebuchadnezzar had to come back again. And then finally in 586 BC with the third invasion and that one was the one where he completely destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple area. So it doesn't work out very well when you are uh, in rebellion against God. And like us, even today, if we continue in sin and we are truly believers, we should expect chastisement. That's right. Remember, our sins have been judged, but we will be chastened of the Lord. Right. So there's a sin that's unto death. 
and there's sins that are not unto death, God gives us a chance to be able to repent. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, you'll notice that we find here that there's a sin that has been committed by people that is a sin unto death. And maybe we should look first. Well, no, we'll just do these. So Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven men. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Remember that. Mm -hmm. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come or the age to come. So the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, a lot of people are worried about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, saying, you know, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit now, no, therefore I'm unable to be saved, I'll never be saved. But the context of this is so very important. What happened in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Number one, Jesus is present here on the earth at the time that this took place. And he was performing all of his works, all of his ministry, all of the healings and everything were done in the power of the Holy Spirit. They were proclaiming that he was doing it by the power of the devil, Beelzebub. So they were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Jesus warned them, don't do that because that will not be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against me, I will forgive you. And that was very, very important. That's why I made the point. Mm -hmm. Don't forget this. Look at chapter 9 now in verse 3. Still here in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 9 in verse 3. In this verses 1, 2, and 3, he entered into a boat and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man that was sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, looking at their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven thee. All of his sins, whatever led to him being in this shape, this condition that he was in. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. So mm -hmm. they were accusing him of blasphemy. Notice what he says then, still in this same chapter, but look over here in the uh, 30, uh, which verse was it, 31 and 32. 31 and 32. Uh, no, not, no, hang on a second, I just lost my place. I think it's 31. Let me come back here just a moment. It's verse 34. So Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons through the prince of the demons. So again, this is the second time that they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. But this time, they were emphasizing that it was he that was casting out the demons. So at the beginning of this chapter, Christ forgave that man for all of his sins, the one when he got out of the boat. But these guys, this is the second time now that they blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. And he tells them in that 12th chapter, those sins are not going to be forgiven you. So there's sins unto death, there's sins that are not unto death. But we have to make sure that we have that right relationship with Christ. One other passage I'd like to share, and I'm going to have Patty read this one. And this is from 1 John chapter 2. And this one has to do with the fact of the denial of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 2, uh, begin here at about, well, let's say verse 18 and go through 20, 21. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that they, might, uh, that they were not all of us. But ye have an, an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. 
I have not written unto you because I know not the truth, but because I know it. You and know it. excuse me, but oh, because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Amen. So here we can find again the assurance that our God is going to forgive us for our sins. And we might be deceived, as we talked about in the session before last. We can be deceived, but God will never deceive us. People will lie to us, but God will never lie to us. We can have that full confidence and assurance in him. So let me conclude then by sharing with you from Second Chronicles, seven, the seventh chapter and the 14th verse. Second Chronicles 7 and Many of you have already memorized these verses or this particular verse, but it's important for us to um, remember this. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Are you already there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Second Chronicles. I'm in first. Sorry. Okay. You're still ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want to go ahead and read that one for us then? Which verses? Just verse 14. Okay. First, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. We need a revival in this country. Yes, we do. And that revival has to begin with believers. And as believers are faithful unto the Lord and we're repenting of our sins, God will lead other people to himself through us. We will be his witnesses, his disciples to help them. And as they come to know the Lord, God promises even to us today that these verses will be fulfilled. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven. And he says that he will heal our land. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again for the opportunity to be able to share your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd be honored and glorified. And Lord, that many people will turn unto you in these days in which we're living where there's many antichrists and many that are trying to usurp authority over you. We pray these things for repentance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pray, pray, expecting God to answer because he does hear. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm, Thank you.